Hey everybody, welcome to back to another edition of My Darkest Hour. I am your host, Stefan Brigatti. You probably know that if you're watching this right now, you're already following the channel. So glad to have you guys here. So we've been talking over the past few weeks about different investigators. And if you watch the show, you see the barrage of the people that I'm bringing in covering different aspects of the paranormal. Now today, I'm very excited to have my special guest on tonight, longtime good friend, of the show has been on the radio show a few times and it's a great time to get him to come on the video show to this podcast and it's really an honor to have him finally become part of this and for those of you know that we've been talking about the pacific coast paracon coming up here in june the beginning of june which we're all really excited about and he is one of the people that i'm very excited about having coming to the paracon and this type of uh investigator in the paranormal, I think is very, very important. We see all different types of people, but this investigator who I've, I've spent much, many, many times talking about and talking to, we, we discuss um, paranormal practices. We talk about techniques. We talk about equipment. Uh, another huge thing that he always talks about, and I love this, is safety. Safety is a huge, important thing when we're going out there into the paranormal world to do the investigations. We're all excited. We're all grabbing our gears and our batteries and we're heading out there. But there are so many things that excitement takes us away from that we need to get into the habit of making these checklists, making sure everyone's got the safety equipment, make sure everyone understands what's going on and uh, doing paranormal investigations safe. And that's a huge important thing. So uh, with no further said, Let's go ahead and bring him on. Tonight, we are proud to feature uh, Mr. Keith Bailey, who you guys know, and we've talked to you over the years, and you've seen us little snippets at the Vulture City Paracon in the past. So let's just go ahead and bring him right into the show and get started. Keith, Bailey, what's is. up, Stefan? The Mad what's Man up? Man, I'm so humbled to have such a, a very cool and uh, – also cosmic at the same time, a little bit about the past, uh, some things that I was involved with, uh, some things that are so cool now that are happening. But I will tell you, I, I'm, I'm honored to be the guy a lot of times known as that safety guy. And the reason why is every year uh, you hear of some person who takes a, a tragic event, either they fall and, uh, you know, be it twists their ankle, something even kind of minor up to and including people falling, breaking an arm or something else, because we do what we do in the dark, you know, uh, that's how we operate, right? We go into some place that is, you can't see your hand in front of your face. You've got something over your ears to try that. So you're not hearing sounds. You've got a piece of equipment in front of you. You're trying to see out in a field in front of you. But what you don't see is in that next five steps is a, is the end of a balcony that doesn't have our very scanty type covering and you touch that and you could potentially go from the second or third floor and we know what type of outcome would that be. So I, I always tell people, look, it doesn't take long to get to a location early in the light, get in there, do a walkthrough, make sure that everybody who's going to investigate is there and says, okay, here we go. First floor. This is where we're going to meet. If we say get out of the building, we're going to meet in the alpha or the front part of the building. This is the location. We're going to do a head count. We're going to know, okay, if you're in teams of teams of five, that's somewhere about right. Everybody's got somebody that's going to keep track of that. If you got four or five teams, four is 25, 25, you know that those five teams are going to go in, they're going to come out. And the reason that 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 is, is that, Again, accountability. We look out for each other. We we work with each other. We have fun together. But all the fun stops at an inve investigation the moment somebody is critically injured. It stops. The evening's over. You don't go, oh, well, sorry for Steve. He broke his back. Off we go again. So, <laughs> you know, it's fun to do what we do. We go in these traditionally very long age buildings with historic hauntings. It's beautiful. It's amazing. They're, they have so much history. And that being said, more times than not, we don't totally go in and fix them up to their new pristine level. We want to keep that kind of 
cosmic little darkness about it to, to make it that much more fun investigating. So I don't, I don't take away from the, the event by being overcautious Keith. I'm the one that says, Hey man, thanks for having my back because otherwise I may not be thinking about that safety or something else. So, you know, I'm pretty blessed. I graduated from the national fire Academy and wrote three templates on the national level in the fire service. If many of you may not have known, I'm a retired fire captain from Houston fire here in Houston. And uh, I was honored to get to go there and actually um, was recommended by a team of my chiefs that said, we won't keep to go. And I, so over a four year period, I wrote these templates and they went on to now be as actually speaking uh, concepts in the fire service, you know, forever. So I take what I do really serious when I wear that hat. Uh, mm -hmm. Now I'm wearing, you know, a ghost hat, but um, it's, it's, it's because I care for the people in and around me. I would take that personally. If I was with a group of people and somebody got hurt that I didn't see or say something. So, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of who I am with that. But um, that's you know, awesome. I mean, yeah, just the background of being a firefighter. You know, one of the hugest things you guys are training on is safety. Right, right. You know, yeah, right. Which is very important because I personally, I walk around in the dark. I've smacked my head on pipes that are hanging down too low in these damn asylums. I'm, yeah. I'm walking, holding my this little tiny square of a night lighting right. camera for the best. Right. And I'm slamming my shins into something. It's like, really? So we, we found with that that some of the research we've done is of success of people being able to move about in the dark with not having that. And then people who do. So you got to think that lights in the dark, just blind us, right? Our vision outside of that is not, it's not possible. Now people who have forward facing lights out in front of them can move about and see. So we found that what we, what we do is, is if we have someone that's doing that, Somebody is right there with them, kind of, you know, say, hey, watch your step. Okay, we're going downstairs or whatever. Uh, it doesn't take but a just a moment of time to call those things out. Hey, guys, look out. Big, big drop here. Big, you know, and you go, okay, man, cool. You know, I see it and call it out because when you do, everybody gets to go home. When you don't, somebody's taking a ride in the bus and off to the hospital. And then, you know, what have we done? So, um, Lights are, you know, even though you think a flashlight, right? And people always say, oh, gee whiz, oh, God, it's so boring. It's everything else. Well, one of the things I tell people when it comes to tech and equipment and everything else is that if we look at this flashlight as being used not only for safety, you can actually use this flashlight to what? If, if, if something has density, like we're saying shadow figures do, we're actually able to then say, okay, there, Mr. Spirit, I've got a flashlight down there, or it's, you know, if they didn't have those back in their day, I've got a very bright light. If you can step in front of that light and black it out, can you do that? And I've had a couple of times to where they'll feel comfortable doing that and do it. And you're like, oh, there it is. So there's no Moving down, so that straight line will say, "Oh, yeah." And with the lights and stuff, that's that's an important thing because it, it's how your eyes react to the the vision of the lights when you're using it as a softer light or as a hard light. Uh, right, it, it really makes a difference in what your it, your eyes are able to perceive. Yeah, you, you're off in that in that that abyss. We always like to say, you know, when we go off in this, you know, it might be a warehouse. So we're going off in these different parts of it, and uh, you know, some of it doesn't have any power, and we're investigating. So a flashlight is a you know is a must. One of the number one pieces of equipment I tell people: start with a flashlight. Then you can have a recorder. You can have some sort of something to take pictures. And, of course, a trigger device. There's three things I always tell people. 
the just the, the simplest forms of how we investigate. You know, you want to try to get some burst photos. You want to get something, just a nice recorder. And then a trigger object, like a nice EDI, if they're, if they're able to manipulate that, then you can say, okay, then you, you started your very basic three little investigative tools. But you can have some in, amazing investigations just with that, you know, uh, a flashlight, a camera, a, a recording device, and some trigger object like an EDI that can, or, or as we call it, the multi-tool of the paranormal that has so many functions. And you're really pretty much ready to go. You can have a great investigation with that. Uh, coming in, bringing an 18-wheeler and offloading it into the, I mean, the more you put out there, the less you really get to focus on what's around you and what you may see, which, what you may feel. Like I just felt this burst of a eight degree temperature you know, drop on your EDI, which is enough to what we're thinking spirits are now. You get something to that. That's pretty substantial in a non H non HVAC building, right? Heating, air conditioning, ventilation, and space in air conditioning. So that's pretty substantial, especially in a confined space. That's that's Absolutely. profound. That's pretty profound. You can say, okay, that's a pretty that's interesting. But we are finding, and I've talked to some other great investigators who were finding that humidity is a is another thing that uh, ties in with with uh, paranormal type activity. Even, even as much on that EDI as pressure drops. So in that confined space in a room, if so much human life is in that room, and then a paranormal type, you know, entity or something comes in, you get a variance, right? And there's that change of pressures in, pressures out. And remember in the paranormal, it's not that it's just one thing we say, oh, it's paranormal. It's you. Usually two are more interesting. This is really, this is pretty substantial. So then that's when we can say, we're going to add that to our book. We'll look at that later and, you know, move forward. So uh, that's why I always tell people, the more you're paying attention to what's around you, the more you can probably truly experience than, than not. So. And another important factor is, and I push this all the time on the show. I always talk about, Get your base readings done as soon as you can <laughs> because you want to know if there's any changes. How are you going to know if something's changed if you haven't gone through and did a base reading? So for people out there that, you know, you kind of say, well, what's a base reading? Well, what is it? And what do you mean? And folks new to the field or so forth. So when we come in, right kind of the second thing in line with a safety run, walk, a walkthrough, is we start getting our base readings. If a building is, in fact, uh, you know, charged, it's electrified, it's got, inner, you know, power coming into the building. When you actually have your equipment, you're going to start getting those variances on that equipment. It's going to, it's going to tend to fluctuate from a, from a zero to, you know, a, pos a positive reflection, right? Mm -hmm. So when you do that, folks, then you're going to know, okay, so something's causing this. If you go through a building with no power, no reason for getting any readings, and suddenly you get this huge fluctuation from a zero all the way to a positive two point, you know, you know, two zero point oh, like a whoa, and then it goes to zero. That's really that's pretty profound. That's really interesting. Uh, those are readings which make you think, okay, what was that? Because you don't usually get readings that high. Uh, the highest I got in in a room one time was uh, four five point two, which we found out later that in that room is where we actually have classified what we believe, with other investigators collectively deciding that there is in fact a portal in that room. Uh, there's been there's been visual uh, type interactions from that room uh there's been children who have seen something from the wall walk through it so as we put all these types of findings together 
we started realizing that it, and in fact, that's, that's a high possibility of a portal to reflect that much of a huge uh, EMF type uh, reading. So, Absolutely. And with, and with a large uh, EMF response like that, you can, you can feel that you can feel the energy change in the room. Right. It, 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 vortex is drawing from the ions in the room and it's creating that vacuum. So the environment's going to change. And so that's I, why you need to have your base reading. Oh, I did. I ended up talking to somebody who's a friend of mine. I live in Houston. I talked with somebody with NASA and they talked about fluctuations and energy and exchanges and so forth. And I brought up portals. So of course, then that object come up. Well, in, in nature, we think that there's actually some that get created over time and that they open and close. Looking up portals in, in, uh, in, in modern day now, there's a great article from NASA about portals and how they have found that they open and close daily in our universe in so many different places. So they'll be totally kind of just there. They're just moving about if th that they're, you know, just exist. All of a sudden they tend to shift and then they'll close. So that's when you'll get people say, it was strange. I, I I didn't feel this way. And then all of a sudden, I just felt like all the energy went out of me. So that's when we're thinking that there's an opening. There's something to where it, it, it does, in fact, shift. And there's a portal wall, or if you want to call it that. And then, of course, when it closes, they feel as if they're like, whoo. Man, I just, I don't know what happened. It's like almost blacked out. People get uh, spots, they get nauseous, they get uh, all kinds of visual disturbances. And with that, you've got that over abundance of loading into that confined space. Um, you know, one could argue that too much of that in that one would certainly be uh, very unhealthy for someone to be subject to that much energy in that one space, it's going to cause them to actually uh, physically get sick. And so that's why you'll see these electricians and so forth come out with their meters. And if they see this. This is well, is there a poor conduct, you know, with electrical, is there some problem? And then they have to go in and try to, you know, find that answer as well. Absolutely. And it, and it makes sense. For those who are trying to understand paranormal theory, um, things like vortexes, even the ghosts entering into a room, they enter in and they start charging up, they start taking the charged uh, ions out of the room, which are like atoms and nucleuses, and it, they're fully charged. So they're absorbing that, trying to make, either they're going to show themselves or they're going to try to do something. Same thing with the portal. You're feeling it, you're being drained the ions that you carry because we're naturally conductors is, right. is draining that energy out of you going to use, whether it's the spirit using it or the portal manifestation happening. Um, that's why it's always important before you go into a building, check your senses, see how you're feeling right now. Are you, are you hydrated enough? You know, are you feeling lightheaded and you check yourself before you go in because you as a subject, you're one of the most important tools in your toolboxes because your body's right. going to react to the environment that you're walking into. Right. So even as much as being a paramedic and, and all those years, and even besides of the fire service and so forth, since about 1986, uh, findings is people who are dehydrated, they go to these locations and then tend to start sweating. A lot of times, even in winter, you do sweat in winter. If you've got cold zone and you go from an outside environment to an inside, you sweat into that clothing, that clothing that absorbs it, and you lose fluids. As you lose fluids, you and if you are even remotely close to being dehydrated, then you become more. So then, if you start having these situations where you're moving and moving and going upstairs and down and back and forth, what you got left in the tank starts to be, be even more compromised until you start saying, oh, my muscles are hurting, right? You lose sodium. When you sweat, you lose sodium. Uh, and then the worst one to lose, which is can be you know, uh, catastrophic, is potassium. Potassium is in your heart. 
So the sodium potassium pump, right? We can kind of cheat a little bit with some fluids for sodium. But if you start getting into severe, you can affect your heart, which that's why you get tachycardia to compensate to try to move those fluids. But if it's going to try to upload those fluids to get you charged, it's going, it's like a runaway pump. It's not moving any fluid. You get to be dizzy. Oh, and then you pass out. Well, when you're flat, it's you're at an equilibrium then. You're at homeostasis. You're flat. It's like put you to the ground and it's like now fix it. That's when you gotta, you know, you gotta be time out. You gotta go out. You got to get some fluids and more times than not, that shuts the evening down because by that time trying to play catch up, it, it can take you out. If your muscles start to hurt and you have a syncopal episode, that can be very dangerous because it can affect other things. So I tell people when you come to these investigations, come happy, come healthy uh, and, 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 and more than anything, you know, come there to, to have fun with the rest of the folks and learn. Um, because otherwise you could become part of now the investigation is we're like, you know, where's Bob? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, you, you, oh man, what happened? I passed. And then then off you go and then boom. And so yeah, that's never a good thing. So it doesn't take long, you know, have that day where you're ready for it. You, you know, I always say if you charge your batteries for the investigation, you got to charge yourself the battery, your big battery, which is you, right? Fluids, you got your food, your, your you know, your blood sugar's up enough because you're going to burn a lot of that just by pure adrenal, adrenaline out there going through. What do we investigate now from like 7 p.m. To, to midnight or one or two? So we're going on like six hours of go, 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 nonstop, you know, heart rate, you know, 110, 120. Oh, man, did you see what he saw? And then you're just pushing it, but you got to, you got to do it in a healthy way. So, you know, I tell people, you know, come prepared yeah. to, to, to do that. So. And your first aid kit, make sure you have lots of water and put some power bars in there. Just in emergency. It, it's it's an easy one, man. You pick it out of there. You chop it on it a little bit. It's got all your, you know, a little bit of your sugars, a little bit of protein, right. just, you know, a little peanut butter, whatever, just enough to take the edge off. Right back in the game, right from that point. On. Right, ready to go at it. Let's go see that, that apparition they said they saw. Yeah, then go back and find it. Absolutely. So, Keith, for for those viewers who are uh, finding out about you for the first time, can you tell them a little bit about your first paranormal incidences? What got you into the industry? Well, so what got me in the industry is uh, some people don't, some may not, but it's. Uh, Nevertheless, it's, it happened to me and, uh, it's, I guess the gift I have now. So I was 13 years old and I had an anaphylactic reaction to a medicine called Torican, which they don't make anymore. I think it's been removed. It's, it's gone. Uh, I had a reaction to that medicine. And when I, when I did, uh, I started having an issue where my airway was closing. I, I was feeling sick. Next thing you know, um, I got sick enough to where I couldn't hardly move any air. Now, fortunately, there was a little man coming out with his groceries to the car next to two hours. My mom and Ann had went inside. And I had got to be to where I, I it started going dark around me. I was looking around like, maybe can anybody see me? And then it got to be, I went past where I couldn't hardly breathe. I got sleepy. And then I just, it just, it went to dark. Well, the next thing I know, all I could do is hear. Even if I was thinking, open your eyes, dummy, open your eyes. Uh, I wasn't seeing anything. I was only able to hear things. And then I would hear people and, oh, well, no hurry. Oh, God, no. And um, so what he had done is he had ran inside and said, hey, call, get an ambulance here. But this was back, I was 13 years old. It was before 911. So uh, they end up getting a police officer shows up and, of course, yelling, uh, what kind of drugs has this boy done? <laughs> and I was a drummer, but I was no drug addict, drug addict. Yeah. So, uh, you know, they get me out by this time though, I had lost my pulse. And so now they're really going, Oh, this is not good. This is not good. So they, uh, went through a process of doing CPR. And then I went from where I was able to hear, but then I heard less of people. And then it went, the moment I couldn't really hear anymore. I saw, 
And I remember just for that moment, I saw everybody running around, running around, and then it was less and less. And then I just was from that, it was back kind of to darkness again for a moment. But then I remember I was just kind of alone and I was like, okay, now, now what do I, at that point when I was in the darkness, I, from the way I was looking, it was dark. Back this other way, it seemed like there was some light, but it was way somewhere off. And I just remember going, well, can't see much this way. I'll, I'll go this way. So I remember I just was like, walk. I don't know where I'm going. Maybe I'll find somebody that can help me and say, hey, I'm lost. So I remember as I walked and I walked, then I could start really hearing even more. And then I could really start to see really good. I remember seeing that there was just this little trail with little, little dirt, little rocks along this path that I just kept wandering and wandering. Well, as I go down the path, I keep going and going until finally it goes to a little upslope. And right about the little upslope, I look down and down on this side in this little green little, just enough of like a small acreage of grass. I look down and I could see that there was one person looking out towards this little lake, facing away from me, looking towards the lake. And I was like, hey over here so i may, i remember making my way down the trail even more in a hurry like you can... hey i'm lost i need my way down to it it got down to where i couldn't really go anymore i had to get to down the little path to with a person so as i made my way down to the little person this person kind of turned around and looked and it was my grandmother now my grandmother had passed some years before but i was close to her now, I remember at that moment, I would talk, and I was just doing what I'm doing now, just blah, 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 trying to tell her what was happening. And she would shake her head till finally she had had enough of all that. So with her left hand, she kind of grabbed my right arm, and she would squeeze. When she squeezed my arm, she answered the question I would ask. Like, Grammy, are we in? And it would be heaven. And I was like, oh. Okay, this is it. I'm I'm done. I don't know what happened, but I'm done. And I sit there and I kind of look back at her and she would just smile. Well, I had another question and it was, am I going to stay here? And she said, you'll see. And that was what squeezing me again. Well, right about the time she stopped looking at me and she looked up out in front of me, just about right out enough to where it's like you could touch, but you couldn't actually reach it. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie predator but if you remember what the predator looked like when he was invisible and he was like oh, this yeah. little ectoplasm well there yeah. was just there was like everything was very clear real time but in this very shape of this like long tv thing or like a table but it, it was like a slideshow the very first thing started out with me and my little brother we were little babies and we were just there and it was me and kevin and then it would be that, and then it would just go on to the next little thing. And then it was like grandparents holding us, and we were a little older, like rocking us. And then I looked back at my Grammy, and she just smiled because that was her holding me. So then the next one got to be, we were playing. I was playing with little fire trucks, and Kevin was playing, and a little older. And then it got up to be to the fact that we're right about where I was playing baseball. And I would be running the bases. And I would see my dad as I'm sitting there and he would be going, run, Keith, run, keep telling like this. And my mom was like in slow motion in the bleachers, go, Keith, go. And and there's my brother. He was a shortstop. I, I was a pitcher. And he was going, come on, bub, come on. So all of this was like, wow, it's, 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 it was just, I, it's like, it's right there. I'm seeing it. And she kept smiling and then it was there and it slid to the last little part, which I was in the car. And then it went like that. And then it just went, it straightened out and it was gone. So I sat there and I was like, okay, well, <laughs> that was the show. Now what happens? And so I remember her, she squeezed my arm, but she just would comfort it this time and just kept patting it. So then she stands up and I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Ho, 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 ho. No, 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 no. You can't go anywhere. Don't leave me. You know, and she stands up, but she just kind of turns and has me go back up the, the little path, go up. 
she goes a little ways behind me, but I get to walking. And I remember I was talking and I look back though, like she was right behind me. She'd already made her way right back down to the bench and she was looking towards the water again, not looking at me. Oh, and I uh. was like, but where do I go? So I tried to walk forward where that path went to, where I could see the beautiful little lake. I saw the birds that flew by when they had their little wings, like effortlessly. The water would ripple, but it looked like a lava lamp and a lava little tall little globule deal has the water would ripple. And I look at that. I'm like, I want to go that way. But it, I, I couldn't get through it. I couldn't. I was, uh, oh, and then I realized I just sit there. And finally, I was like, well, so then I went, turned her back around. And I said, well, I guess I, this is there's only that way or this way. So I made my way there. And then all that beauty as I looked just if in a glance to look back was like it was just there and it's just gone and I'm seeing it and it's gone. So I made my way back down the started the journey and then I could start to hear Keith Keith we're here Keith and I would hear my dad I heard like my mom and I could hear them and then I started feeling that's when I started feeling the pain I was like Oh, oh my, oh my chest, somebody said my chest, get off, get off my chest. And, oh, it was terrible. It's like I couldn't breathe. And then, then I kind of real quickly kind of came back through and I could see everyone. And then I was just like that, just there back again. And then it was like, I was looking down and then I was upside down, like just, and I was looking up. And the reason I couldn't really try to that I was having trouble breathing I heard her through my mouth and I was like burp, 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 <laughs> trying to try to yeah. move my mouth and the doctor say don't move don't move just don't move and then another doctor that was there was like this was like oh my god because what had happened was this they had actually decided that they had done everything they could for me so one of the nurses went in the room and was getting me all ready for my family to come see to say their goodbyes and right about the time that they were making everything great, I moved my right shoulder, like trying to uh, get up. And she goes, ah, ah, she ran out of the room. It scared her really bad. She's like, she thought, <laughs> I, was, coming back to life, yeah. thought I was gone. And then she's in the hallway and she's like crying. He's, he's, uh, he's, a uh, he's alive. And then, then that's what my dad and they just burst past the doctors move. And they went in there and they started talking and really, well, I found out what say my life is. They found that I had a cardiac anomaly. And what they found is, is that the doctor had not shut off the IV fluids, which my heart was kind of trying to pump, but it was dry, right? It was, there wasn't enough fluids. And so that dripping of the fluids and the dripping of the fluids and the dripping, finally, when it started to try to beat, it finally got in sync and started to where it was perfusing blood. And he wow. said, he said, if we would have shut off that fluid when we decided to stop, you would have never woke up. You, we actually did like a fluid resuscitation on you because you have cardiomyopathy, which is the, the, so this disease is when they see these kids running down the field and suddenly they go, oh, they collapse over. That's what I have. Uh, and they found it as a little boy that time they did an x-ray and my heart was huge. They were like, Oh my God, he has cardiomyopathy. And they wow. said, otherwise, if you'd have been playing sports and ran and collapsed, man, not have got you back. So with that, save my life with that. I have now a, just, I, I would, the one thing I would say it is that I feel is a ability to see people that are really pure and beautiful. And I guess I see them as like light. They're very bright to me. They're very beautiful. They have this almost angelic glow kind of from the face down. They're just, we connect. I walk up to them and I'm like, hello. And I get to talking and then we share this very beauty. And I've also found that with that, I'm able to see people that kind of made 
appear to want to be that way or profess it, but I see in them and I don't see that light. Uh, I kindly pull my tongue. I don't, I, I'm never the one to say, because I'm not the mm -hmm. one that's going to be judging at the end of time. Uh, but I can say that I can see lightness. I can see darkness. And uh, people, you know, that day is going to come to where they're not going to be. They may be, there may be that they do that here on earth, but the day will come where the all, you know, the almighty and powerful. And I think a place I went that was so beautiful, more beautiful than anything here on earth, uh, will know the difference between true light and and uh, not not real light. So uh, I just try to be that love and light to people here now. And, uh, you know, people need it in this world. There's a lot of people that are in pain and sadness and they've lost loved ones. We've lost paranormal people, colleagues, friends. And uh, the more we can try to be, even if we can exchange some kind words and say, hey, if you need somebody to talk to, hit me up. I, you know, if anything, I'll be there for you to talk. That goes much further than somebody who doesn't even try to say they'll talk to you. And, and that's what's really sad is sometimes in life, somebody just needs someone to talk to them more than anything. Absolutely. And you never know when something can happen to anybody at any given time. So when you see your loved ones or the people who are close to you, let them know that you're there and that you love them because you never know. We're, that might um, be the last time. Yeah, it could be any time. So make sure you get that in there. Right. Then you won't regret it. So at least I told them like, I care, you know. Hey. And I'm there, and they got an open. If they want to call, I'm there. So it means a lot. Awesome. So, hey, let's talk about your uh, podcast. How's that going? Well, so the fun thing about Talking Tech is uh, it, it, it was created from uh, a collaboration with another beautiful person here in this world, Kelly Miller. And uh, I was I was actively searching to find a beautiful soul of someone that I feel that we would really have a love for each other as not only as colleagues, but really as friends, you know, when you do a podcast with another person, you go behind the scenes of the highs and lows they go through in life. So if you're about to go on the air tomorrow and that person is going through some tough times, you know, you spend that time to say, Hey, are you okay? Are you all right? Do you want to talk? You laugh together, you cry together. The most importantly, they're like family to you. And if you if you don't have that with someone, uh, you're going to know it pretty quick. And uh, so I've learned a lot in life. I've learned some lessons. I've grown a lot, I would say, in the last couple of years. And getting to have this podcast kind of gave me a rebirth. I took, uh, I took some time away kind of from uh, the paranormal. I, I guess COVID was that time. Uh, it kind of almost idealistically put me aside for some time, much needed to get through some dark times. But the nice thing about it is at the end of end of it all, not only did COVID go away, but some of my darker times uh, in the paranormal really uh, went away. And now I'm, I'm back. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm with a person who uh, I care about very much and she cares about me we're buddies we look out for each other and man that's a special thing when you get to have somebody that you really know is not trying to how you know upstage you or uh let them know that you know they're so much more uh have they offer so much more in this world than you do they're just like let's do things together so that's why we even say uh the host of the show and the host of the show we don't say host and co-host. That was from the start. I said, I don't like that. <laughs> I, I'm not coming here to have a show and have you be a co-host. We both host the show. I bring a tech side with things. She, uh, she has a beautiful way of talking to people. Very insightful with a lot of the things she brings. And we have had some amazing people on that show, you know. Um, and, and even as, as of last night, people get on there. It's, we try to make fun a uh, Monday's fun again. You know, it's not always fun on a Monday. Mondays yeah. can be that. Wah, wah, wah. And so we try to say, you know what? Let's make it fun. So we always like to say, if Stefan's on the show, hey, folks, it's an evening with Stefan. And we just say, you got the mic. You're live and in concert. You're the headliner. You're the opening act. 
do it. And, you know, you just talk about who you are and your life and the paranormal and everything else. So that's why I, I look, really look to make it special. And uh, we, we have a ball. We got some amazing things coming up later this year that I'm like, whoa, I get to be a part of. We got to ask and we're like, well, sure. So I, I, I always I always say this in life that if, in fact, you know, you don't get to be at somebody's, you know, cool Kool-Aid stand, go find the cool, cool Kool-Aid stand you do get to be at. There's lots of Kool-Aid stands out there. And if somebody doesn't want yeah. you to come to their cool Kool-Aid stand, Okay, I'll go drink my Kool-Aid somewhere else. Somebody's always happy to have you. Somebody's always say, hey, man, come over here and let's have fun here. So you have to, you know, just respectively learn that about life. You know, there's just going to be those times where uh, it may not be that place somewhere. And you go, okay, you wish them well, you be kind, and then you go find another place to get to, you know, hang out with folks who are like-minded friends and peeps. And uh, it, it pays off. I've, I found life stuff on is way too short. We can either sit around and muddle and muck and kind of shed our tears where we stand. Or we can go, okay, best of luck. God bless you. I'll see you down the road. And go find those cool kids down the road that you want to go be friends with. And go make magic happen with them. Because a lot of times that's just the thing you needed is the inspiration, you know, to make you driven is to have a something close on you. Only to, you know, to really inspire you to go open something else. So I did. And I tell you, it's really paid off. Uh, now we're we're getting invited places. And, hey, do you want to be there? And you want to come do this? And, hey, would you like to do this with us? And we're like, wow, how cool. Uh, and I've said it before. I've lost most of my family. So the paranormal, when I say it, it's not just a catchphrase. A lot of them are my family or my absolute real you know, black brothers. I lost my twin brother. I lost my dad. I lost my mom. So I got, you know, about three people in my life that are immediate family, you know, um, you know, my sister and, you know, and, and Chase and John. And then after that, it gets into peeps like, you know, James and Edo and Carly Hall. And, uh, you know, you're another one they get to hang out with and have fun and run around. So I, I take my friendships and they are, you know, they're an extension of my life. I, I like to always think if you need something, give me a call that, that, that they really know that and, and, and mean that. Cause Hey, uh, uh, to get to the West coast from the third coast is nothing but a flight away. All right, man. Be there in about four hours. Yep, Cali exactly California, California is cool anyway. So, yeah. you know, it hurt me going to the beach. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, nice. To let the, yeah, there you go. I'm down with that. <clears throat> So absolutely. And I'm really excited to have you come out here to be part of the, the Paracon. We're right here in the central California area. I tell so, you what. I mean, literally from, from the theater, it's a block away to the beach. So we got to hear uh, some good things about that place, but we went out uh, and actually got to investigate at a hotel that uh, someone we were talking about in the show uh, there at the beginning of the show that used to work at. And uh, we got to investigate there. And I will tell you that this hotel was lots of activity. And yeah, yeah not not too far from where the place we're going to be there with, with you. But I, I think that's a cool thing about California. It's got as much as history along those railroads and the gold mines and the, and the, and the brawls and the, the bars and the old buildings there. So this is going to be cool because I've heard a lot about the place. And now getting to come there is just going to be another one that's going to be super amazing. Yeah, it's it's one of those places that you step into and you step back in time. It takes you away to a different era, which is amazing thing about this place because it's, it's a, almost 100 years old and it's just gone through so many eras and stuff. And a lot of those impressions of those eras are still left behind. And be, that being said, the whole downtown area is like that because the whole downtown area is from the 1800s. Well, so, see, so that almost be it a hotel or anything else around there, you go, you probably yeah, could, think. you could probably do a little short EVB, EVP burst and, and say, man, you wouldn't believe what I got out there over hotel. So, oh, uh, absolutely. That's, that's walking around cool. downtown. You can find a, a hundred places that'll have activity. It's crazy. Jeez, man. Yeah. I find myself there, even before going to the theater, be like, just 
Wow, that's cool though. That's uh, that makes it a, when you do go on a place like that and and um, a show and a paracon and then a visit, you just get to say, man, I I want to go back. It just fuels you to get to want to come back. So um, I've got an I've got something coming up this July that I'm. I tell you, I, I don't know if, whether I'm excited or just ecstatic, but I don't know if you've seen it on uh, Facebook, but uh, if you've seen the big uh, Mike Rinsecker July event, yeah, Ireland, yeah, it. Ireland. Yeah, that's huge. Uh, you know, a year ago or more than a year ago, it kind of popped up and say, hey guys, anybody thinks you want to go? And I'm like, you know, I just, I just think I'm feeling it. Call it a once in a lifetime trip. So be it. But the history of those places, 400 years old. Wow. Some of the darkest, most brutal, blood curdling prisons in the, in the world, on the planet. I mean, when you were sentenced to death, there wasn't any rule book of death. It was like, you're going to die and they're going to decide how to, you know, want to, yeah. want to take you out. Slowly, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, and it was like, you got, you know, there was no, Hey, we're going to try. You get a retrial. We're going to talk. We had a hung jury. We did something. No, that was it, dude. It's game yeah. over. So yeah, that's probably why they, they didn't have as much crime back then too, because they really made you responsible for what you did. But, uh, so that's going to be cool. I'm looking forward to that. That's, uh, I've even been buying equipment. I'm like, good God, just for that investigation alone. But because you're going to be in such dark environments with such long hallways, just fraction of moment, you're going to get those, those, those photo ops. So, you know, I bought another lens. And so I'm excited. I, I'm looking forward to that trip for, for real. So. Sounds um, amazing. Yeah. And so then the others are, of course, the big ones. I don't know. Are you, are you going to go out to the bash this year, out to the Gettysburg bash? Oh, uh, I don't know. I've got a lot of big things yeah. happening around me. So I don't know what my next step is in the future because there's just too many big things happening that are coming at me. And they're coming at I mean, me like nuts. So I don't know. Yeah, you, you get them and they say, hey, call us, give us a call. You, we're going to you know put you down and let us know. And you're like, oh, my God. You you find yourself in a month's time. You got four events. And, man, that stuff wears you down, man. Travel, travel, travel. That's like my buddy Dustin Perry. You see him and he's like, you look on Facebook. Just got home. Got to work for the week. Oh, off again. You know, take off and landing. Yeah. That's because he's out there inspiring people. <laughs> he's, he's on tour, buddy. He's Mr. on tour. Dustin Perry yeah, live in concert. Dustin. He's my buddy, man. I, I I love Dustin to death. He's a yeah, he's a great guy. Hard, hardworking guy out there making the making as he says making magic happen, man. He's, he's got he's great good. hair, so that's awesome. Hey, if, if if I had hair like that, I maybe is it cool, but I yeah. don't. So I I ask him about that all the time, man. He just laughs. So he knows I'm can now. I I love him today. He's like a brother to me. So absolutely, he's a great guy. So what's the next step for you? What's your what's your thing coming up? Besides the trip. Well, so uh, some big things. I've got uh, a phone call. I've got a place with somebody that we're looking on doing a local documentary. And we're going to, I'm also looking at doing a documentary on the East Coast. And uh, both of these locations are, uh, they've already been documented as far as activity. So we're not coming in there shaking bacon, you know, doing the whole hits and see what we got. We know from the past that there's there's documented evidence uh, in, in all forms. And so what we're trying to do is then get to a, you know, um, so what is it that, that keeps you here? It's almost a, a, a round of a research document. We're really getting in trying to say so. So what is it? You know, what is it that you you don't want to move on and why? And, you know, is that uh, and, and, and I think that as we continue to push on something that we find that a lot of that is fueled by constant um, interjection from the living coming there, fueling those, those locations that uh, even though some may be residual, there's some intelligent type hauntings and they just are a smorgasbord of that, of that oven, keeping that, you know, the paranormal fuel burning. And then, and then from there, it just, it just ramps up. Uh, and so then the other is, is a location that we do in fact feel, well, we have a, 
recording actually uh, of, of camera recording visually of this portal as as it opens and something leaves it. So now cool. it's going to be, yeah, it's it's just that good. And I to even see it, I thought, you can't really say that's anything else. You see it as it opens. You see as it's what comes out of it and then down and, and takes off. And then you see it as it's there, and then it's then it and then it's just gone, and then it's the wall again. And so that's again going to be a matter of, you know, having the equipment around and in a grid formation to where we can start to see what ac- equipment is activated, and then with the recordings of the, uh, you know, on the stance of the questions of you know what you know, what is it about that it has this place be so drawn that you know entities come here and you know who you know who opened this who was this was it has it always been here was it here when this before this home was built was the home built around it and it just remained there so lots of things that you you really try to almost get in a living room environment on these documentaries to really sit back and ponder okay so so then what but what why is that and then you continue to push, and we find we we're finding even even more that as we do the research, these spirits. When we actually say, "Can you see us?" We actually have things that we will show them, and we're right there, and they intelligently say exactly what the answer is to what we're either holding or have. And so then we're like, "Okay, so you you're seeing us," and they're like, "I can." So we're starting to find that they answer questions, they hear us. I'll even go as many as, you know, not three times. How many times did I knock? Three. And then uh, who says here? He was here yesterday. What's his name? That's Chuck. And they they just continuously. So we're almost getting to a point to where we're realizing truly the only thing they don't have is a body. And, um, you know, that's put in the ground when they pass. And then what's left is, of course, the spirit. So that's why we're starting to find that uh, these spirits, these souls, uh, we've even found at the 1912 Hoover house that, uh, we're even pondering the questions now, do they have emotions? Can they be jealous? Um, uh, we had a situation with a friend of mine that I was talking to the spirit and, uh, I guess we can cuss on the show if we have to, right? Yeah. It's, it's an adult show. It's fine. So the next thing you know, we're talking to the spirit. I'd been fine. Everything was well. It was a female spirit. And I was, everything was fine. We were talking. You know, okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. That's, oh, we're just having a ball. And the next thing you know, my friend came in. I introduced her to the, to the female spirit. And we're just having an eye. We're waiting for a hello. Oh, it's not a hello. It's a big fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> I go, hold on. Wait a second. Hold on. Wait. Hold on. Oh, but it gets better. Wait, there's more. So that night we investigated and I was like, okay, so it gets to be late. It's late into the night. I mean, so we're, uh, some other people were kind of moving about. I was upstairs in the bed, kind of had the phone a little bit. So then I'd finally laid there, kind of dozed off. I was asleep enough to know that I was out. And so the next thing, you know, as this happens, I feel something like quickly grab my ankles. And I mean, like a grab, like a, I got them. And it was enough mm-hmm. to make me wake up and like, who the hell is so stupid? So then I do that. Then it pulls me straight down away from the head of the bed. It was enough because I reached out for the head of the bed and I was getting going down the bed. Now, this is the first time this has ever happened to me. In all my years, people talk about, I was scratched, I was grabbed, I was kicked, I was punched. They pulled mm-hmm. my eyeballs mm-hmm. out. I had never had anything like that happen, but I was pulled. So when I finally got to be, okay, that's it. I've had it. I went down there ready to just hit somebody that's on the edge of the bed. There was nobody, no living person. I turned on the little lamp and I looked down there and there's nobody. And I finally at that moment was like, look, you cussed me earlier. You're mad at me. Okay, we're done. That's it. All right, I'm going to bed. You want to go have fun, go somewhere else. So she did. This is what she did. She went room to room to room to room, went in and those other rooms she locked the inside lock from the inside she turned the lock you couldn't get in the room and it was locked and so i was like okay she did it 
So we got a name for her now. I, I uh, talk, was talking to somebody to, today about it, and we got a name. So when we go back, we're going to have a nice, long, little investigation with her and say, hey, I didn't mean to upset you, so I apologize. So we'll try to see what those emotions, if she's like, okay, you know, I'm sorry or whatever. But uh, she was not happy. She was not having it that time. She was upset. So, you know, do they have emotions? So we try to go a little more, push a little more, get a little bit more evidence because at the end of the day, it was someone's loved one. So I just try to show respect. And I think that comes back to us. And the more you respect them, then the more evidence they're going to kind of share with us. That's exactly it. You know, you got to give them respect. Once they see that you respect them, they'll respect you and they'll be more, they'll be more comfortable around you and you get better evidence that way. That's all. I was going there trying to be the, the cool guy and have, make them have fun. You know? it seems yeah. Work. Who doesn't love a musician though? I mean, you come in there, I'm Stefan. I'm, I'm, I'm that guitarist guy. Oh, Stefan, man. I was up in the club the other night. That was me in the back. Well, you couldn't see me, but I was there, man. I was feeling it. So. Yeah, I mean, Absolutely. you know, being cool does go a long ways every time. Absolutely. Awesome, man. Well, I know an hour goes by pretty quick, and we're, we're coming to the end. So um, where can people uh, reach out and get a hold of you? Where can they find you? Look, right here on Facebook, most people always reach out to me right through there. Uh, if you reach out to me and you send me a little message like, hey, Keith, I got a question. I got this piece of equipment and I got it and I'm really not sure. I get lots of those. I don't mind. I, I'm more than happy to help you. Oh, Lord. And that's cool. I mean, I get, I get, I, I do the same thing. I always put it out there for people have questions. Let me know. People send me photographs or videos of strange things and want my opinion on them. And I give them my honest opinion. So it's not my fault if they get, they get mad. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I reach out all the time. Yeah. So. so if you tell me it's a ghost and I just tell you, oh, no, that's just condensation. Don't get mad at me. It's just my opinion. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. Absolutely. Well, all right, buddy. I do appreciate it. And I, I'm looking forward to seeing you at the Paracom. When you're coming out there, I'll show you around and we'll have a good time. Um, thanks for having me on the show. Rock and all roll. Right, Keep you them, uh, loving. All right. See everybody soon. See you soon. And that's Mr. Keith Bailey, everybody. Good friend, good paranormal investigator, just a good guy all the way around. Make sure you check him out. You can find him on Facebook. Check out his tech, his talk in tech. So great show. If you have questions about talking about technical issues or practices, or you know, like we're talking in the beginning about how important safety truly is reach out to him and he'll tell you what you need to do before you get you go out there and get started. And I also want to say, don't forget, we are doing the Pacific Coast Paracon and we will be, uh, they're speaking, like there's me, I'll be hosting the event, Patty Negri, who you guys all know, will be there and Bender, Unearthing the Supernatural, my, my Navajo brothers are coming down to uh, do some investigative and tell you a little bit about their interesting story. Author Brian Clune will be joining us. Of course, Mr. Keith Bailey, who you guys just saw and talked to, he will be there. Mark Barber Nelson, Peter Golson, uh, great speaker. I, I teach with him at the uh, Magicus University. Tara Mead, spirit photographer. Richard Leonard, of course. Uh, you guys know him as Richard Sennett. He is a pioneer in the field. He's been investigating for a very long time. Has some incredible books, and he's a great storyteller, and he's going to tell you lots of experiences with ghosts that he's had in his years. So you can go to the Majestic Ventura Theater and uh, join us at the Pacific Coast Paracon coming up on June 3rd and 4th this year. So hope to see you guys there. Um, so come check out the vendors. Come check out the streaming services. Whatever you have to do, come check it out. Shout out to P-Tech, one of my longest – sponsors who makes all the lights that I use in our investigations, which is rooms, lighting up the rooms, keeping us safe so we can see what's going on as we're bouncing around off things in the dark. So with that being said, we will see you guys next time. And make sure you go to find Keith on Facebook, ask him some questions that he says he will always be glad to answer. Them. So.
So with that being said, you guys, we will see you next time right here on My Darkest Hour.